Welcome to the National Press Foundation. We're coming to you from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios. I'm Chris Adams, Director of Training for NPF. Today, we're continuing our series on understanding global trade. It's the eighth of 10 that will explore how trade alliances and supply chains are shifting, how trade enforcers are trying to maintain fairness, and how workers and consumers are affected by it all. We're thankful for our sponsor, the Heinrich Foundation, an Asia-based philanthropic organization that works to advance sustainable global trade. An update on another program. We've opened registration for a July 22 training on real world evidence, how the use of big data is changing scientific standards and the way drugs and devices will be approved. Among the guests in this half day program will be Dr. Mark McClellan, former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration and now a professor at Duke University. Register at nationalpress.org. On our website, you can also find videos, interactive transcripts, and resources from recent programs, such as last week's talk about the growing tax gap with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, a discussion with Emory University Law Professor Dorothy Brown on racial inequalities in the tax system, and reporting tips from legendary journalists James B. Steele and Diana Henriquez. We also have resources from our previous trade programs, including, including those on China's threat to intellectual property, the digital dollar, trade enforcement, and fixing the medical supply chain. Today's talk is on the semiconductor shortage, how it came to be and how we can get past it and why it matters so much. Just look around you. In our increasingly wired life, semiconductors power every form of technology, which powers everything we do. Our guests are Alex Capri, an author and research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation. He recently released Techno-Nationalism via Semiconductors, Can Chip Manufacturing Return to America? And just this morning, China's microchip ambitions. And he's finishing up a book, Techno-Nationalism, How It's Reshaping Trade, Geopolitics, and Society. Meng Chiang is the Dean of the College of Engineering at Purdue University, and previously was a Professor of Electrical Engineering at Princeton University. He also spent much of 2020 dispatched to the US State Department as a science te technology advisor to the secretary. And Debbie Wu is a reporter from Bloomberg News, based in Taiwan and covering the tech supply chain in Taiwan's semiconductor industry. Before Bloomberg, she worked for the Nikkei Asian Review, the Associated Press, Apple Daily Taiwan, and Taipei Times. We'll hear from each of the panelists, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. You can raise your Zoom hand or put a question into the Q&A text function. And please tweet today at hashtag NPFTrade. So I'd like to welcome all three of you and welcome all of our, our journalists and other viewers on the call. I was noticing on the registration just a little bit ago, we have folks from 17 different countries, the US, uh, much of Asia, Israel, and lots of other locales. So we have a good wide ranging audience for this talk today. I wanted to go to Alex first. Um, I'd like to thank Alex for coming to us from, he's in Spokane, Washington. So it is six o'clock in the morning for him. Um, so thank you very much for getting up early for us, Alex. And I was hoping you could give us a sense of, of the importance of the semiconductor shortage and the semiconductor supply chain as it relates to techno-nationalism and you know, the ongoing um, balance of power between the US and China. Certainly, Chris, and uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, good afternoon. Um, well, let's start with the chip shortage itself, um, and, and the world is in the midst of a chip shortage. Um, what I've recently described it as is a, is a perfect storm, right? Why do we have a chip shortage today? Uh, what has happened? And what we see is sort of the convergence of, first of all, COVID and what COVID-19 uh, has done to supply chains worldwide. We had... Um, critical supply chains, particularly in China, um, shutting down uh, initially. Um, so that, that's number one. That's impacted specific industries. Uh, I, I would say the automotive industry in particular is really feeling the pinch right now. Um, uh, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. The second thing is, is geopolitics itself. Um, and, and that is, of course, uh, you know, I don't want to call this a cold war, but we can say it's a hybrid cold war, right? It's a, it's, it's a situation where we have uh, strategic industries that have now become um, subject to uh, decoupling. Uh, they've become subject to reshoring and geofencing or ring fencing, if you will. Uh, global supply chains are restructuring. Uh, they're having to diversify, if nothing else, China plus one, plus two, plus three, 
or just uh, a, a full strategic decoupling, as 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 we'll see. Uh, I think coming down the road around rare earths, um, certainly strategic uh, semiconductor parts, at least the leading edge um, uh, portion of semiconductors. I'll talk later about, um, well, hopefully somebody will ask the question because I'm only going to talk for about five minutes, but um, I'll, I'll make a distinction between leading edge semiconductors and trailing edge semiconductors and what that means for the industry where China is going uh, where it's trying to go with leading edge, but not uh, not anywhere close to achieving its goals, and where it's going with trailing edge, which is the older technology, and 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 there we see China making making progress. Um, so um, these things are so 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 we've got geopolitics, we've got COVID. The third element uh, that I think is going to play uh, an increasingly important role uh, for semiconductors in the future is climate change. Um, you know, as you know, semiconductors require huge amounts of water. Uh, so Taiwan, which of course is the world's hotbed of semiconductor fabrication with TSMC and that whole ecosystem embedded there in Taiwan. Um, you know, Taiwan's in the middle of a drought, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see increasing uh, challenges environmentally around the production of semiconductors. And of course, because semiconductor value chains are so geographically dispersed, um, it has a huge carbon footprint. When you consider that a, a wafer, for example, uh, might, uh, you know, if, might leave one country and come back a half dozen times uh, you know, in, in the manufacturing process. So those three things, I think, are part of the perfect storm. Um, now, from a geopolitical perspective, uh, we are in what I would describe as a paradigm shift. So we've seen, you know, really four decades of heady globalization and expansion. Uh, and that's been attributed to, uh, you know, a, a, almost a, a laissez-faire uh, uh, economic model. Um, you know, there, there's been very little constraint. I mean, we've never really truly had free trade. But there have been few constraints uh, on a rising China, which was not playing by the rules uh, when it came to uh, subsidies, state-centric capitalism, um, you know, five-year plans, technology transfer, and so forth. And so we're in the midst of a backlash. Uh, we're in the midst of a, of a China backlash with the things that I've, I've, I've mentioned around decoupling and so forth. So that will continue. Uh, and that will affect strategic industries. We're also seeing um, techno-nationalism uh, and the focus on techno-nationalism um, is around national security, economic security, uh, and increasingly now how technology or the applications of technology um, either enhance or destabilize politics and society. Uh, and of course, semiconductors, because they are the heart and the brains of every industry of the future, uh, certainly every item on China's Made in China 2025 plan, and virtually anything having to do with the Internet of Things, um, communications, anything, essentially, uh, semiconductors are at the heart of that. So they are the most coveted and, and the most uh, increasingly restricted uh, and strategic technology that, that we see today and going forward. Um, so techno-nationalism comprises those three things. Um, I should point out that this is not a zero-sum situation. This, we're not going to see a situation uh, where we have a full decoupling of China with the West. Um, that is happening again in the strategic areas. And that's what makes this a very, very complex situation uh, and it creates what I would call a hybrid kind of Cold War, where global value chains are essentially being um, trifurcated, right? They're, 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 they're sort of splitting into three different streams. The first is the strategic stream, which I've talked about. The second is the more ambiguous and what I would think would be uh, sort of the gray area or even the danger zone, where we have all these dual use technologies, which are technologies that are commercial, uh, designed for commercial applications, but can also be used for military applications and therefore could become subject to export controls. Um, you know, uh, entities and stakeholders could wind up on restricted entity lists, 
We're seeing this with a whole range of Chinese tech companies uh, today, uh, which I think are in existential crisis when it comes to trying to expand internationally uh, because of, uh, because of their, their dependence on dual use technologies. And then of course you have the American companies, uh, certainly the American semiconductor companies that are making a lot of money, uh, particularly around the trailing edge uh, portion of semiconductors, uh, you know, where China is their major market, uh, they have Chinese partners uh, and so on. Um, okay, so I think those are the those are really the the, the highlights, if you will, of the chip shortage, uh, and of course techno nationalism, how those things are converging, uh, and of course I'm I'm happy to uh, to engage with the distinguished panelists um, going forward on 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 you know looking ahead and 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 other issues. So I'll turn it over to you now, Chris. Okay, so. Um... <clears throat> calling up a, uh, uh, your book is coming out soon, Techno-Nationalism, How It's Reshaping Trade, Geopolitics, and Society. Um, you're kind of in, in final, the final sprint on it, is that right? Okay. So we will be, we'll be looking for that later on in the year. So uh, good luck with that. So now I want to turn it over to, um, turn it over to Meng Chiang at Purdue University. Um, uh, Dr. Chiang, Alex was talking about the perfect storm right now. A couple of years ago, uh, Purdue and TSMC, which we've been talking about, and, and other entities um, came together to launch the Center for Secure Microelectronics Ecosystem. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about kind of how that came to be. Um, and, you know, this is in place now. What, do, what is it you're trying to accomplish with it? And, you know, how soon, I mean, will what you're doing now, will this yield immediate benefits in helping solve the chip shortage? Or is this just kind of laying, planting some seeds for helping, you know, ease chip shortages years down the road? So I want to welcome you and I hope you could tell us a little bit about your center. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, NPR, for inviting me to be on this wonderful panel on this important topic. So as Chris mentioned, I'm the Dean of College of Engineering at Purdue here. Uh, and it's part of my job to brag about it first, that Purdue Engineering is the rank number four for our graduate research in the United States and uh, uh, one of the largest uh, ever to be ranked among the top five. So uh, when we had a conversation with PSNC, the world's leading manufacturer of uh, logic chips in Taiwan, headquartered in Taiwan, uh, we've had long relationship with PSMC and many other leading semiconductor and microelectronic companies over many years. Uh, and back in spring 2019, we started exploring a potential research center focused on secure microelectronic ecosystem. Not only the manufacturing part, but also the entire supply chain. And we had a handshake agreement later in the fall of 2019, and then the pandemic hit. But earlier this year, in spring 2021, we officially launched this center together with TSMC and also Synopsys joined us as well. And I understand that uh, the picture you showed earlier, Chris, with the leadership of two professors, Anand and Jorg, are the ones that you just showed under their leadership we're working with number of other universities and companies uh, to uh, launch uh, a lot of the fundamental research projects. So this will benefit the industry in unique ways, but it will not be a solution to the near-term uh, chip shortage that we're facing today and the ones that Alex just explained very eloquently. However, we do believe that security is an important dimension and the fundamental research at places such as Purdue, in conjunction with industry leaders such as TSMC and Synopsys, will make eventually a big difference. I also want to highlight that uh, we're working with um, a large number of other companies. Uh, for example, over the past uh, few years, uh, Purdue College of Engineering received uh, no fewer than nine different federal and industry funded projects and centers around microelectronics and semiconductors, ranging from extreme packaging to prototype uh, manufacturing 
to validation to uh, uh, software and the system dimension of chip design. And uh, we will have, for example, a uh, launch event later this year on uh, September 22nd, whereby the uh, new Intel CEO will be the keynote uh, to launch a uh, new think tank, what we call a tech tank, Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue, uh, which is an independent nonpartisan think tank. Uh, we have a lot of great relationships with uh, Intel, with many other two uh, manufacturers, with other chip design companies, fabless companies. Uh, so it's not just about one or two companies, it's about an overall ecosystem that we're working on. Uh, and uh, the shortage of chips that you just mentioned, highlighted, uh, will be a issue that will require a lot of effort, not only from fundamental researchers like those here at Purdue, but also uh, the entire industry and the government effort, uh, as I'm sure you're gonna uh, mention in a few moments time. Uh, but uh, while we're doing that, let's not forget about fundamental research importance. What we're gonna see a few years down the road will be rooted in the kind of research that we can do in centers like this today. Okay, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit, getting into the government issue. Um, in 2019, you stepped away from your role at Purdue to serve as the science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, at the time. Was the looming semiconductor shortage, was that, was that part of the discussion then, or was it not quite seen on the horizon yet? Well, Chris, uh, as you said, that uh, I took a one-year leave of absence from Purdue University starting uh, late December 2019 for 12 months to serve uh, in the State Department. And uh, semiconductors has always, I think, been high on the list in how we think about national security and economic security, how we think about digital economy and supply chain. Uh, this wasn't news. Uh, in 2019 or in 2021. And if you look at a continuation of policies from one administration to the other, uh, we are heartened to see this as a enduring and bipartisan effort to ensure that the United States will be a leader in semiconductor industry and will be able to secure its entire supply chain Okay, and so we'll come back a little bit later to talk about some of the efforts in Congress and the administration to accomplish some of those goals. But I want to turn now to Debbie Wu, and uh, Debbie is a reporter at Bloomberg based in Taiwan, right in the midst of covering uh, the Taiwanese semiconductor industry and the current chip shortage. Uh, she and her colleagues recently put together a fascinating 20-minute video that is kind of must-watch what must watching if you want to get a good sense of the chip shortage, its origins, the technology behind the current chips today, and kind of the, the supply chain and the business model that these companies follow. Um, uh, we are going to show six, 60 seconds of this uh, great 20 minute video. So Jeff, if you could cue that up. Almost everything we use depends on silicon semiconductors called chips. From your iPhones, your fridge, your air filter. The most advanced supercomputers, the most basic toaster ovens. What's turning on your indicators? What's turning on your radio in your car? That's a chip. China's government is lending the industry the same strategic importance it gave to its atomic bomb program. It's arguably a lot more important because you are talking about China becoming uh, self-reliant on the technology that powers all of uh, mankind's uh, future scientific advances. The result of all this, multi-billion dollar plans by multiple countries in a race to dominate the mother of all cutting edge technologies. Okay, so that is, a, as I said, a, a very well done and informative video. We will put a link for that on our resources of, from this session that we post online later. We'll also have a link from Alex Capri's uh, recent reports, as well as lots of other resources that'll help reporters cover this topic. 
But Debbie, um, I want to thank you for coming to us. It's late at night in Taiwan, um, 9, 920 p.m. there for you. Uh, you are, you've been in the thick of covering the chip shortage and the semiconductor industry for, for you know, covering the industry for years and covering the chip shortage, you know, in the last 12 to 18 months. I can hope, I was hoping you could just give us an overview of kind of how the, how the story has changed over the recent year or two and kind of where you think it's headed. Okay, so um, I think the whole chip shortage is really a watershed. So uh, when I started at uh, Bloomberg about three years ago, it was more semiconductors um, were considered more like a niche topic, really. I mean, there's a small group of readers who are interested in the subject, but it's not like, uh, you know, as widely read as, um, uh, let's say, uh, customer electronic stories, such as, uh, you know, what uh, new iPhones Apple is going to uh, give us uh, in the uh, um, in the holiday quarter, that sort of thing. And so uh, I I'll just uh, uh, recap very quickly. Uh, so last year when I was writing about semiconductors, it was also kind of like a very uh, specialist subject. So last year it was uh, mostly about, um, okay, uh, US sanctions against uh, Chinese companies, including uh, Huawei's uh, semiconductor design unit, high silicon, and also uh, sanctions against Chinese, uh, the Chinese chip making champion, SMIC. And a couple of other things that uh, we uh, covered last year was like TSM, uh, the Trump administration's efforts to get the uh, uh, TSMC, that is Taiwan's uh, uh, largest chip company to uh, build a new uh, chip fabrication plant in the US. And another uh, topic that's of interest is like uh, Apple's efforts to make its own uh, silicon. So uh, overall, like before the current chip shortage hit, it was like a small number of uh, readers or a specialist that uh, really cares about uh, uh, the uh, semiconductor as the subject, including uh, those who are watching uh, the uh, US-China uh, conflict closely. But ever since the uh, car makers starting uh, making noises about the, how they are suffering from much shortage, then it really becomes a global story that a lot of people cares about because um, uh, the uh, automotive in industry is actually quite important to uh, uh, several countries' uh, economic activities. So that includes the US and Germany and of course, Japan. So uh, I, I mean, the, the sense I get is like uh, since uh, the beginning of this year, it's a story that's uh, getting read by a, uh, by a lot of people in a wide range of uh, uh, industries. Because in car makers case, I think they never expected that there would be one day they are, what well, I mean, while they are considered like 800 pounds gorillas in their own industry, like car makers are the uh, the kings of their own individual industry, but it looks like they never considered there was going to be a day that they will be uh, fighting Apple, which is like the largest company in the world for components. So the story gets uh, interesting. It becomes a uh, cross-country, cross-continent, and cross-industry story that's Get, that a lot of people are starting to uh, uh, pay attention to. And then uh, because of this uh, chip shortage and the car makers scrambling to get enough components, now we are seeing uh, every government pledging to uh, boost their uh, domestic supply of semiconductors to ensure that there is a steady supply of uh, chips for everyone, for uh, every industry. Okay, so one, well, a couple of things that I, uh... I want to get into from all three of you is, is basically answering some of the basic questions on you know, why why is this important um, this important economic activity so so centralized in, in one country how did that develop and what is the U.S. doing to try to U.S. and other countries trying to do it to kind of release their uh, 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 ease their dependence on Taiwan um, so for starters I was hoping you could give us. Um, just a little bit of a little bit of, of basics, uh, um, uh, Alex. If you could maybe tell talk a little bit about you know advanced logic chips and and what exactly are those and how are those different from how are those different from other kind of, of chips and why is it that so many of them are being are being produced by this one important company TSMC? Yeah. Okay. So so first of all, I, I think Bloomberg did a great job. Debbie did a great job with that article uh, explaining just how utterly difficult, complex uh, it is to make, uh, to mat, you know, in commercial quantities that are virtually error-free, 
um, you know, a seven nanometer chip or a five nanometer chip. I mean, it is the it is the zenith of human engineering achievement. I mean, making a you know producing this type of technology, these these tiny tiny, I mean, vert, you know, microscopic um, transistors that have hundreds of thousands of connections, if not more, um, is very 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 difficult to do. So American companies, uh, you know, American uh, semiconductor companies continue to dominate when it comes to the IP uh, and the technology itself, when it comes to the design software, uh, the, you know, the R&D, the front end of the, of the value chain. And they dominate um, with the, uh, the equipment that, that, that is necessary in the manufacturing process. It's a, it's a complete uh, I mean, really totally dominating that. But over the years, what these companies have done is they have outsourced and offshored the fabrication of this, of, of this technology because it was a great business model. Um, you know, if you're leading in the innovation uh, and, and you're, you're selling a lot of these chips, um, if you can offshore it uh, to make it the most cost effective, um, and take all that money and plow it right back into research and then, you know, just keep that cycle going. Um, that worked out really well uh, for decades. Uh, so the offshoring and the licensing model uh, was really um, something that, that, that put us in the position that, that we are today, uh, and which is that, that the, for leading edge chips, um, supply chains migrated to Taiwan in particular, uh, TSMC uh, is by far the world's largest uh, subcontractor of chips. It, it subcontracts to all the major American um, uh, semiconductor companies. Uh, and, uh, Debbie mentioned uh, SMIC, SMIC. Uh, she mentioned uh, you know subcontracting to High Silicon, which was which which is uh, Huawei's uh, chip division. Um, so this this. This began gradually, and again, over year after year after year, and, and decade after decade, and remember, Taiwan has a special relationship with the United States. Uh, the US uh, government encouraged a lot of that investment and that development uh, over many years. So where we're left with is um, a, you know, virtually a single source supply chain, uh, which, is, which puts the United States and Europe and pr virtually anybody uh, in a very precarious, vulnerable position. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a screen from my uh, report that came out last week, uh, uh, which is the update to the original uh, Heinrich Foundation report on semiconductors. And that really shows you just how, I, I guess it shows you two things. One, it shows you that U.S. companies remain dominant uh, in supply chains, and it shows you that China, despite being the world's largest market and having insatiable demand for microchips, has virtually no production capabilities uh, and has virtually no um, localized ecosystem to produce the chips that it, the, certainly the leading edge chips um, that it needs. So 10 nanometers and below, um, China's nowhere near getting to a point where they can produce that. Okay, so I wanted to talk, uh, uh, Dr. Chiang, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it will take to get to that. Um, Alex, in your report, you noted that the founder of TSMC cited the lack of US, of U.S. manufacturing base and the dearth of highly skilled labor that's required for complex chip manufacturing as being some of the problems with the kind of the U.S. industry on this. So Dr. Chiang, since you're, you are an educator, I mean, what will it take to get the U.S. workforce and get the U.S. engineers up to the skill level they need to be able to compete uh, with TSMC? Yep. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, echo what Alex has said. That, uh, in my mind, there are three key words as to why we are where we are today. Uh, and those are very unique features of this particular industry. Uh, the first key word is uh, specialization. Second is scale. And third is trust. Specialization happens in many different industries. And in the semiconductor industry, one big specialization moment was when Maurice Chang, the founder of TSMC back in the 80s, 
uh, had this uh, genius idea that uh, as the industry matures, design of chips and manufacturing of the chips do not have to be belonging to the same company. And there would be a lot more designers than there would be manufacturers. And manufacturing is uh, a game of scale. And that specialization led to the creation of TSMC. And it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always believed by market that this would be the way to go. But uh, Morris Chan was proved uh, time and time again to be correct. The second keyword is scale. We're talking about extremely complicated and sophisticated and precision driven and hard to get high yield rate kind of manufacturing process. And these days, each large foundry would take billions, if not tens of billions of dollars to construct and operate. And one single equipment could cost easily 100 million, if not 150 million US dollars. And the large foundry, you need 10, 20 of those. And that's just one part of the tooling that you require in addition to utility, material, and gas, and so on. So scale helps a lot. The economy of scale brings you tremendous benefits. So there's a reason why, from economics point of view, that you have a lot of the logic manufacturing concentrated in Taiwan, a lot of the memory manufacturing concentrated uh, by mostly three South Korean companies, but all located next to each other in one corner in South Korea. And this is why you have some of the tooling companies such as ASML in Europe uh, that also presents, if you will, a single point of failure uh, because of the scale it takes to get that sophistication sustained. And thirdly is the word of trust. It's not just about demand and supply, but as the manufacturer of many competing chip designers, all of your customers need to have the ability to trust that you as the manufacturer will not only be able to produce the high quality technology needed at five or even smaller feature size nanometers, but also the intellectual property that they are giving to you will be well protected and guarded. And you will also not be competing against them. So those three words, you put them together, specialization, scale, and trust define a very unique industry. Now, as to how can the United States uh, regain the leadership in manufacturing, not just tooling, not just software, not just design of the chips? Well, I think there are three elements to that. One is uh, we should continue to welcome companies such as TSMC uh, to come over here to the United States. And in parallel, we should continue to encourage and incentivize companies headquartered in the United States, such as Intel and many other companies, uh, and make sure that they will be able to, again, be leaders in manufacturing and packaging of chips. And third is, back to your question, Chris, about education, about talent pipeline. There is a supply chain, not only of products and services, but also of talent. That pipeline of human resources is arguably the most important supply chain of the end of the day. Uh, so again, not to brag about Purdue, there are many house, outstanding universities throughout this country, but also uh, as the executive vice president of Purdue University now, uh, I'm proud to say that Purdue is graduating uh, more engineers uh, than ever before and then uh, pretty much any of the other top universities in the country now. And we need more. We need more American K-12 students to be interested in engineering. We need more of them to take advanced courses in mathematics, in physics, even when they're in high school, and encourage them to explore majors such as electrical computer engineering when they are undergraduate students here. Uh, and just one more point on this shortage. Uh, I want to anecdotally uh, share with all of you something that you have read perhaps from Bloomberg's or other news outlets, that the automotive industry, which is very intuitive to a lot of Americans and people around the world, something they can see and touch and drive is not abstract idea of something called wafer, 
Uh, well, some of the manufacturers of automotives, from trucks to passenger cars, have to furlough their employees right now. And they told us that they would be happy to pay them overtime had they uh, got the chips that they need. So that tiniest, the smallest thing you put into this wonderful automotive product is now bottlenecking the labor market, bottlenecking uh, the take-home pay of so many Americans outside of the semiconductor industry. So this is why semiconductor industry is the foundation of both national security and economic security. Okay, so... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, for our, our viewers out there, if you want to ask a question, uh, submit it in the Q&A chat function down at the bottom or raise your Zoom hand and we will turn it over to you. I see on the call we have a couple of our former fellows out there, um, Jennifer Schlesinger of CNBC and John Quain of New York Times. If you guys want to ask a question, uh, raise your hands and, and uh, we'll work you in. I have a, a question here from Samuel Moore, a senior editor at IEEE Spectrum. Um, very broad-based question, and I, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Debbie, um, since you're kind of, you are in contact with the companies and kind of getting a sense of what's going on with their business. Very basic question, when and how will this shortage end? So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, oh, in, the, uh, uh, in the last earnings season, most semiconductor companies that I've uh, covered, uh, running from TSMC to uh, uh, the uh, big auto chip makers in Europe, so Infineon and NXP, they, the most companies agree that uh, this chip shortage will extend into uh, next year. And then uh, some chip makers even suggest that uh, some uh, uh, trailing, uh, some trailing tech or some mature node chips could be in a tight supply uh until uh, 2023 so that's two years from now and then um, i'm talking about um well they are not the uh, most cutting edge chips that apple put put into their iphones these are uh mature chips that uh, uh every car will need to uh control things running from uh, airbags and then uh, brakes and then a the number of things and then um, as to how this can be uh resolved so uh one way that this can get resolved is for uh, companies to start building a uh, capacity. But chip makers has been quite careful because previously we have seen uh, uh, boom and bust scenarios uh, quite a number of times in the past. So uh, chip makers has been uh, quite careful, but at the same time, we are seeing uh, some um, uh, foundries gradually uh, building up capacity, including uh, <clears throat> US-based global foundries announced today that they will invest 4 billion US dollars to build this new uh, factory in uh, Singapore to help elevate the uh, auto chip crunch. Okay, so um, uh, I want to talk a couple. A couple of things we want to talk about is 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 the the Trump trade war and kind of how that had a, had an effect on the chip shortage, and then talk about you know, the building up of capacity, uh, echoing what Debbie was talking about. Um, but Alex, could you maybe you know talk with me a little bit about the about the the global dimensions of this? The Trump administration was increasingly aggressive against China and firms such as uh, a cell phone maker Huawei. So describe for me some of the actions of the Trump administration uh, that it took against Chinese firms, and did that have an impact on have an effect of making the chip shortage worse? Well. Uh, you know, when you look at techno nationalism, um, techno nationalism continues uh, with the Biden administration, and I would I would say that um, you know these essential strategic industries, um, this is going to be the norm going forward. So I think there are, there are uh, at least two critical dimensions. Um, the first is the weaponization of supply chains, meaning that if, uh, if a, an American company or um, you know, a home, you know, the home team, so to speak, um, has an advantage in a particular niche or in a particular part of a value chain, and, that, and it's a part of a strategic industry, then uh, the use of non-tariff measures will come into play. And then we've seen that um, you know, with the increase of sanctions in particular uh, you know, uh, aimed at companies and individuals. 
Um, so that has uh, certainly had an impact on the chip shortage because we know that companies like Huawei and other Chinese companies uh, that either anticipate or are you know on the verge of, of being uh, sanctioned, they will stockpile. They will they will buy chips uh, in advance to try and 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 sort of hedge against a potential um, uh, you know, uh, export control down the road. And that has clearly impacted uh, the chips, you know, the situation that we're in today. Um, I think another aspect uh, of, of uh, supply chains is when we look at um, the reshoring, as, as we've mentioned. So <clears throat> clearly in the United States, we have Intel, we have Samsung, of course, we have TSMC, um, all investing in, in plants. But again, uh, as Professor Chang mentioned, you know, it costs 10 to $20 billion to build a fab. And, it, and it's not something that you can do overnight. It takes, uh, it takes a long time. You need hundreds of engineers. Um, it's a very, very slow process. So even though we're seeing an inflow of money, and of course, um, uh, the, you know, the, the other aspect uh, that, that we're seeing in terms of techno-nationalism is the increased amount of government funding. So we have Chips for America Act, we have the USICA. Uh, so you're looking at overall more than $200 billion uh, that the government, in terms of incentives and funding that the government is looking for uh, to, to provide through uh, R&D, uh, funding through tax incentives and so forth, and 52 billion of that uh, is is slotted for the chip uh, sector. I'll just quickly say, um, again, to address the question on you know how long will this chip shortage be around, uh, and at you know how long does it take for manufacturing capacity in such a hyper specialized industry? Uh, that has rationalized uh, value chains around the world for decades. How long will it take for the U.S. to claw back um, manufacturing capacity? That fifty-two billion dollars that we're talking about, um, you know, the 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 uh, SIA, which is the Semiconductor Industry Association, estimates that um, fifty fifty billion dollars might get two percent of market share back. Uh, right, so from 12% of market share today in the United States, maybe to 14%, possibly to 15%. Um, so we can see that this is going to be a long, ongoing process. And I would just say that this is the beginning of the next moonshot, right? So I think uh, Debbie, in, in the Bloomberg's um, piece that that we that we previewed, you talked about the development of the atomic bomb. Um, I would say that if you take the race to develop the atomic bomb, um, the uh, space race between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 60s and the 70s, um, we, uh, those were the first two real techno-nationalist, um, uh, you know, moon, let's just call it moonshots. Uh, semiconductors are part of the third moonshot, um, this race to bring semiconductor manufacturing back to the States. So I think we'll see a lot of public-private partnerships and we're in the early, early phases of this at this point. Okay, let me ask a couple of very, very basic definitional questions. Um, uh, first of all, you, you, I've heard the term being thrown around, um, fab and foundries. Uh, can you just tell our viewers what, what you mean by fabs and what you mean by foundries? Basically the same thing. It just means that uh, uh, Professor Chang talked about specialization um, and scale. Um, so, so again, because the value chain is so, so complex, it's very, very difficult uh, to, to vertically integrate this, this type of thing. So uh, um, a foundry or a fab is where the chips are actually made, right? They're actually produced at scale, uh, you know, in commercial quantities, uh, super, super high yield, meaning very, very, very low uh, incidence of, uh, of error, if you will. Um, so again, that's, that just has to do with the many different niches along the semiconductor value chain. Okay. And then another basic question, we're talking about when are we going to solve or when is the chip shortage going to ease? 
but that's just kind of talking about it in generalized terms. Is it going to ease in phases? And so the, you know, the car makers will get their chips first and then, um, you know, cell phone makers will get their chips next or, or how will it, do we have any sense of how it will unroll? Well, that, that was discussed. The Biden administration has had a number of semiconductor summits already in Washington where they've invited, uh, again, these are public, these are public private partnership type events where they've invited, uh, you know, obviously TSMC, Samsung, the automotive industry was there, the tech industry was there, Apple and Google and everybody. Um, and they're, you know, the, the obvious choice there is to avoid any kind of situation where one sector gets preference over another. Um, but clearly, uh, you know, the automotive sector, uh, you know, people are going to really start agitating when they can't buy their cars. And anecdotally as well, you know, Professor Chang, I was out looking at automobiles yesterday uh, and a lot of the new models are delayed. Uh, you can't buy the new 2021 models uh, because they just don't have the chips to produce them. So consequently, uh, the used car sales, I mean, used car values are going way up. Um, so I, I don't know whether the automotive sector will uh, get preference. Uh, obviously, consumer electronics, cell phones and so forth uh, would have something to, to say about that, right? Um, but this is going to go on at least for another couple of years, um, th this chip shortage. Okay. Um, let me, uh, Debbie, let me turn uh, the question to you. You wrote a story um, earlier this year, a year of poor planning led to car makers massive chip shortages. So I was just hoping, you know, since Alex was just talking about that, I was hoping you could just give us, give us summation of how did the car makers get into the pinch that they're in right now? Uh, okay, uh, okay. I, hope, I hope I unmuted myself. So uh, what happened was uh, when the pandemic first hit last year, uh, the car makers were really anti that they were going to see a repeat of the uh, Great Depression back in uh, 2008, 2009. So uh, they scrambled to cut their chip orders. But what happened is like because they cut their orders, so uh, the uh, foundries that makes these chips have uh, extra capacity and then uh, amid the uh, sheltering at home orders around the globe, consumers were uh, <clears throat> snatching up consumer gadgets, including uh, PCs, tablets, and then smartphones to help them uh, stay connected at home to uh, work remotely or to uh, help their uh, children uh, uh, with uh, remote schooling. So uh, foundries, reallocate these capacities originally booked by uh, car makers to uh, consumer electronics makers. And when car makers realized by the end of, uh, by late last year that they actually are seeing a boom in uh, automobile sales, and then they wanted these foundries to make more chips for them, the uh, capacity was all gone. And so <laughs> the car makers couldn't get uh, any extra chips that they want to uh, fulfill this uh, uh, increase in demand for cars. And so that creates a situation that uh, uh, you have uh, been reading that uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, several car makers around the globe have are forced to uh, idle their plants and then uh, sometimes for uh, several weeks in a row. And then so that gets uh, governments uh, really concerned. And now, while the Biden administration has uh, met with uh, car makers and then uh, chip makers to try to find out a solution, at the same time, right now, it's sort of like a situation that uh, people are bidding for a capacity and then you have to pay for a capacity. And whether uh, car makers are willing to outbid, uh, let's say, uh, big tech companies like Apple, then <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's something that uh, we still need to uh, wait and see. Okay. So we've we've talked quite a bit about the um, the the Biden the White House review of supply chains, and so I want to I want to uh, turn a question to Dr. Chiang and then um, and share a little bit from that report. So the report noted that the, um, the 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 White House report was on America's supply chains focused on four critical projects products semiconductors, large capacity batteries, critical minerals and materials in pharmaceuticals and active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs. The report noted <clears throat> semiconductors have been 
have become ubiquitous in today's world. They enable telecommunications and grid infrastructure, run critical business and government systems, and are prevalent across a vast array of products from fridges to fighter jets. A new car, for example, may require more than 100 semiconductors for touch screens, engine controls, driver assistance, cameras, and other systems, end quote. So we, that's one thing that we've been talking about. At the same time, the report noted that U.S. share of global semiconductor production has dropped from 37% in 1990 to 12% today and is projected to decline further. So on one hand, we have recognized that these are critical, but on the other hand, we've let our capacity slip away. So I want to turn that very big quick picture question to you, Dr. Chiang. Um, this has been a slide that's been going on for three decades. Um, it's, it's kind of become a crisis right now. Uh, you know, this is a very broad question, but you know, why did the U.S. for three decades kind of let it slip, let this capacity slip away? Right. Uh, first, uh, Chris, I want to uh, clarify that I think we were just discussing three different things just now. You know, one is export control. One is uh, why the shortage of manufacturing capacity to a certain industry, and one is how can we uh, onshore, reshore. Uh, capacity to the United States. These are three different things. Uh, if you look at the Biden administration, if anything, has gone further, faster, and tightened the export control uh, beyond what uh, the previous administration uh, has done. Uh, so this is a bipartisan enduring strategy for national security, but it has nothing to do with the shortage issue. If anything, once TSMC or Samsung has said, I asked to stop making chips uh, for one set of companies. That releases more capacity for them to make chips for other customers, including car manufacturers in the United States. So that comes to the second point. As Debbie highlighted, some of the customers of PSMC and so on canceled their order last year. I think the critical point here is that a lot of folks did not anticipate the speed at which the economy rebounded this year. That is the critical moment. So people thought, let's cut uh, uh, the, the loss right there last year and cancel the order, we'll go into hibernation mode. Well, it turns out that uh, three months later, the economy is back in full bloom in many industries, and uh, now you want to go back. So that's the reason why, is the speed at which the economy has rebounded. The third part is back to your question. It's again, a game of scale. And therefore what's great, for example, about Arizona plant by TSMC's investment last summer, uh, late spring, is that once TSMC comes in, now we hear reports that Samsung thinking about it, Intel's thinking about it, and then their entire supply chain will be also brought to certain parts of the United States. And once they have the cluster effect, then the snowball will start growing again. So you've got to trigger the snowball growing at some point. And uh, the current CHIPS Act, for example, you mentioned, will help to inject not all the capital needed, that's far from enough, but inject enough so that we can restore market values and we can trigger that avalanche of cluster effect. And finally, I also want to uh, comment on what uh, Alice has highlighted, uh, what he calls the techno, techno nationalism. And I'm an optimist, and I think that tech diplomacy, something that is, again, bipartisan, enduring from both administrations and in future administrations, I would assume, is about the United States working with like-minded nations. Uh, so my last commercial, which is that on July 7th, the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue will be officially announced and uh, love to catch up with you and any other friends in the media to talk more about how can the United States, through tech diplomacy, help solve the long-term problem of semiconductors and other tech needs. So um, thank you very much for that. So the we have, it's 9.54 here in Washington, so we have uh, a few more minutes. If anybody has a question, um, raise your hand now and we'll work it in. But I wanna talk for the last couple of minutes about kind of the, the geopolitical reality of this. And Debbie, you are in Taiwan, um, you know, a tiny island democracy right next to China. Um, I mean, how, 
you know, how worried are people in Taiwan about China being more and more aggressive and trying to exert authority over, over their over their democracy, but also over you know their their tech industry specifically. I think uh, if you live here, you actually don't feel that sort of tensions that's being reported by particularly by the uh, uh, foreign press, and so it's like people go about uh, people still go about their day to day life very normally, like like anyone would, let's say uh, in Washington D.C. or in. Uh, uh, Queens, New York. So you don't have that sort of tensions. But at the same time, this is being uh, talked more and more about given that uh, China's uh, uh, being uh, uh, showing uh, uh, growing uh, uh, aggressions in uh, South China Sea and then in a region. But what's going to happen next? I think it really depends on uh, uh, what's, um, it, it really depends, it's dynamic. That's, I, I think that's probably a word that I'm going to use. Okay, and Alex, what do you think about that? I mean, how how likely is a a flashpoint um, between the U.S. and China related to Taiwan and Taiwan's industry? How likely is that in coming years or or beyond? Well, I don't want to prognosticate on that one, uh, but uh, you know, I, I would say just just going back to um, a single source uh, supply chain, single point of failure. Um, uh, you know, clearly, um, there has to be diversification, uh, of semiconductor supply chains and that will continue. Um, uh, and that will actually accelerate, I think, um, going forward so that there isn't this sole dependence on, on that one, uh, geographic location. Okay. And so, and I was, Alex, I was hoping you could also talk to just, just a couple minutes that we have left here. And Alyssa, if you could pull up the uh, the slide with the um, the new foundry plants, tell me a little bit about um, the the new foundries that are coming or that have been announced for the U.S. Um, uh, when 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 will those actually be, you know, up and running, and when will they be able to start to have an impact? Well, again, I think this is uh, this is sort of a midterm. You know, this is we're talking years here, not you know, not months. Uh, and I think with TSMC, and I think maybe Prof Chang can probably speak to this better than I. But um, you know, they've talked about going beyond the five nanometer plant. Uh, you know, going to five nanometers and even two nanometers in the future. Uh, that, of course, is is leading edge, cutting edge. Um, and that's going to require a, a lot of investment. Uh, but I, I, you know, I agree with with Prof Chang that that um, this is sort of the the catalyst for uh, the building of new clusters, new ecosystems. The challenge will be uh, because the human capital element is such an important part of that ecosystem. Producing the engineers, producing the the intellectual uh, capital to be able to run that. Um, TSMC to, to, you know, to, to really get up and running would have to transfer a large number of its engineers from Taiwan uh, to the United States. And I think that's a, that's a tricky issue um, going forward. But I think Intel, uh, Intel has already announced that they're going to be looking at moving more towards um, uh, the trailing edge to produce more chips for the automotive sector. Uh, and I think we'll see, we'll see you know, the more established uh, companies looking to produce more chips uh, for, you know, for these in-demand niches. Okay. And with that, I, we need to draw this uh, very valuable briefing to a close. I want to thank all of our, our speakers who are coming to us, uh, 9 p.m. in Taiwan, 6 a.m. in Spokane, Washington. Uh, Professor Chang, is, he's, 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 he's here on the East Coast time zone with us. Um, uh, all of our viewers, we have some very valuable resources and great overviews of this topic the Bloomberg video that we showed a bit of, as well as a lot of Debbie Wu's coverage, we have links for on our, we'll have links for on our website later this afternoon. Um, Alex Capri's two recent reports, or three recent reports that have dealt with techno-nationalism and semiconductors specifically. One of them is just out today, it's brand new today. We have links, we'll have links for those on our website. And we will have a full interactive transcript and video of this session, as well as other resources such as the White House's review, congressional action, and news coverage of this topic. 
So for Debbie Wu, Meng Chiang, and Alex Capri, I want to thank you all very much. And for our viewers, um, look forward to seeing you the next time we're online here. So thank you very much.